repetitious to the Psalms. Anybody read the 136th Psalm? We'll get to the 136th Psalm. That's one of the ones that I've got on the list that we'll do. The 136th Psalm is very repetitious. It repeats over and over again. The Lord endures, the mercy of the Lord endures forever. The love of God endures forever. Uh, by the way, that was this song based on the 136th, by the way. And as you remember, in every psalm, what is the main, what's the word I use? What is the main work of the poetry within the psalm? What is the point of the poetry within the psalm? What makes it a poem? Parallelism. parallelism. So every psalm is based in parallelism of different types. We, I, I gave a list. I can go back over it again. I probably will in time. But if you remember, there are different types of parallelism. But all psalms are based in parallelism. Parallelism is the evidence or the point of the poetry because they're not metric meter. They're not lyrical meter. They're not... Uh, um, they are, they can be repetitious meter, that's something different, but all of them are based in parallelism, which means what? Logic. What's that? Well, well, they're based in intellectual thing, that's what you're trying to say, but what does it have to do, what does that say about repetition within the Psalms? They're all repetitious, because if you're near parallel, the first and the second are what? Well, in most, they're exactly the same, but we saw there's different types of parallelism, but you're exactly right. So there's repetition from every verse to every verse, and actually there are no verses, right? They're all added. But from each statement in the psalm, there's repetition, and each is repetitious. So there's great. So what does this say about God and repetition? He likes it. He likes it. <laughs> <laughs> he likes it. So when people tell me that modern music is too repetitious, all I have to say is look at 136 Psalm. I, mean, I, I think I got it in my notes because I've already parsed it for you guys. I just haven't got to it because we've got other things. But uh, let's see, the 136 Psalm. Um, somebody, somebody uh, yeah. get it, read it, read the first couple of verses. Give thanks to the Lord for his good love and mercy forever. Thanks. To the God of gods, his love endures forever. His thanks to the Lord, his love endures forever, his love endures forever. No, 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 no. His love endures forever for the whole psalm. It's what, 26 verses? Um, 29 verses? 26. 26 verses of his love endures forever. Well, actually, it's not love. His sheshed endures forever. Yes, in Greek, Septuagint. Shushed would be quite, actually it's not usually translated grace, a chais, but it can be. So I'm going to talk about these words today because I promised you that I'd give you all the love words in poetry, in, uh, in Hebrew. All the potential love words in Hebrew. You'll be surprised, I believe. That's okay. But my point is this. Okay, and we'll get to the 136 Psalm and, I, and I've parsed it for you. But the whole point is that look at repetition. If God didn't like repetition, would it be in the Psalms? My goodness gracious. No exclamation points. You have to repeat it. Yes, ma'am. But, but some of this modern music, the repetition is not about God. This is all about him and who he is and what he does. Those are kind of touchy-feely about. And I think that's a, a big difference in repetition. The song I just sung with you is right on the radio today. It's from Chris Tomlin. It's a modern piece of music. And it's right out of the 136th Psalm. His love endures forever. His love endures forever. His love endures forever. Forever, forever, forever. Is that about God? That's pretty much about God. Yeah. I don't know that a lot of the other ones are. All of them are. Uh, well, I, will, I can't say all of them are. But let's just say that in, the, in popular Christian music, almost all the psalms are either biblically based, that is from, uh, from the scriptures, or they are logically based like we, what we see in our hymnal. And by the way, all our hymnals, uh, guess what they have? <coughs> what do we always repeat? The chorus. the chorus. Oh, my goodness gracious. If God didn't like repetition, would we have choruses? Oh, no. God forbid, right? 
I just played this out. You know, people, look, what are we going to do? Let's go back to the Psalms. As a matter of fact, that's what it says in the New Testament. Right? You're supposed to do songs. Psalms. Actually, it says songs, songs, and spiritual hymns. That's what the translation says. That's what it says in English. But that's not what it really means. Number one, psalms. What is a psalmoi in Greek? Psalmoi. Right here. Let's see. I get blue. Here it is. This is Greek. P S A L M O I. Psalmoi. Psalms is Greek. Not Hebrew. It's Greek. Because we get the name from the Septuagint. LXX. LXX. And I won't I don't have time to go into detail about Septuagint today. I have before in the earlier classes, because this is part two. But if you have questions, if I confuse you, please ask, because I know if there's people that are new. Yes, and Steve has questions. You go on. Uh, I'm not going to question your analysis that God loves repetition, but just as a counter uh, suggestion, it might also be that the reason repetition exists is because it's easier for people to learn them if you say the same thing over and over and over. I like that too, though. I don't see a problem with that. I think that's good. As a matter of fact, my children, my children were classically educated because they went through Calvert. We homeschool our children. And guess what? In Calvert, my wife doesn't like me to say this, but this is absolutely true. Calvert is like having a 1950s curriculum updated to the modern era. And what did the children do in kindergarten? They memorized prayers and psalms and hymns along with nursery rhymes. That's what we used to ask our kindergartners and preschoolers to do, is to memorize prayers and psalms and nursery rhymes. And then scripture. Whoa, God forbid, right? But yes, repetition and memorization are excellent study aids for people. And so, but God made us how we are, didn't he? We have issues. I have to repeat things over and over again, or I miss them. And I try to repeat them for you, too. Not so that it's rep repetitious and you get tired of it, but so that we get it more indelibly in our brains. Because if you hear something once, what is that? You know, Mac, uh, what I try to do is I try to give you your money's worth. So, you know, if you ever notice, I always have more material and I have it and I present it, you know, uh, at a very high level. And I present it rather quickly so we can get through a lot of good stuff. But the point is, then, in other classes or later, I try to repeat it in such a way that it's not the same, but you hear it a little bit differently or a different context. And because that way, I hope that poof, it'll catch in your brain at some point. Yeah? Well, isn't it true that as you say things or you learn something over and over again, it makes a little crease inside your brain? And I don't it stays know. there. It stays there. I don't know if it physically makes a crease in your brain, but I do know that what it does is your neurons, your neurons are like a web kind of thing. And that's why sometimes something will kick a memory in because your neurons will fire and it will lead down a neuron path. And it's true that, you know, as you build neuron paths, for example, in word usage or understanding of things, the more neuron paths you have, the better it is. And what they say that we don't use 70% of our brains. Let's work at using 100%, right? So we got a lot to go, right? Because only 30% is used, so we got extra. And as you get older, they say you use less, so we need to use more. Because we got to always stay above those young whippersnappers. You can't beat them with athletics, so you got to beat them with cunning, right? <laughs> but yeah. But in any case, Psalms is Psalms, a psalm in Greek is always what? always accompanied with some kind of music accompaniment. A psalm is always accompanied with a lyre um, or something else. Uh, probably not a chauffeur. <laughs> and although he had a little chauffeur, do you, anybody see uh, uh, Cohen? Yeah, he's great. But the chauffeur they have at Remnant of Israel is like this long and will blast out, would fill our our uh, space. It's like, wow. His was kind of weak compared to that, but that's okay. We need to have a bigger one, I think. Yeah, it's portable. It's portable. You know, they have a portable one too, but it's just flat. Yeah. 
trator, right? But a psalm is always accompanied. And uh, what's really interesting is I have Church of Christ friends, and you know, um, there are, what do we call those guys? Um, uh, they, they, don't, they don't use music. They don't use accompaniment. They sing, but someone should tell them that in Greek, psalm, Septuagint, and in the New Testament means accompanied by music. <coughs> songs in the Greek, and I should have parsed this, but I didn't, songs means literally atonal chants without accompaniment. And spiritual songs means a ton, a, um, antiphonal. Okay? Antiphonal on a single is one, and cataphonal is on multiple. And that's what, so a spiritual song means that at each um, syllable, the note changes. That's kind of like our modern music is. You know, we do a phonic chant when we do what? We sing the songs. Uh, and actually, we're doing a kind of phonic thing, but that's okay. But cataphonic means that it moves at each piece. And I'm not a music guy, so if I'm wrong in that, it's okay. It's close. It's pretty close. Um, but in any case, we're looking at, you know, we looked at the 116th Psalm last week, and the big <laughs> characteristic of the 116th Psalm, what was the big characteristic of the 116th Psalm? Anybody remember? It's probably the most personal, it may be the most personal psalm there is, period. Because what? What is the evidence of that? It uses a certain word. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, it uses, it uses aha. Uh -huh. This is, and that's the point, aha. Uh -huh. These are the four words that can be translated as love or like in Hebrew, and actually, uh, in the NIV, does the NIV translate any of these as love or like? I'm not sure. The King James translates these words as love or like. They don't mean love or like at all. There's no word in Hebrew for love or like, really. These two are borrowed words. They're probably Persian. Um, they, this one is probably Aramaic. This one is probably Persian for sure. But they're Persian words probably came out of uh, either the Assyrian or the Babylonian conquest. You remember when they took them to Assyria, Babylonia? What, how did these words come into their vocabulary if they went away? They didn't all go away. Remember? Who went away? Who was taken by the Assyrian and the Babylonian? The leadership. The leadership, the elite. And who was left in Israel? The Samaritans. But they're what? They're all Jewish. This is really sad, right? We talked about that when we were in the Malachi class. The Malachi class is very interesting. I love Malachi. But the big deal is that not everyone, what, what did the Assyrians do in, in the northern areas of Israel? In Israel. They brought their own people in. And then what did the Babylonians do? They brought their own people in, and they assimilated, right? And so that's how they got these loner words. And remember, there are other loner words we've talked about before. What's the big loner word in Greek? Do you remember? Well, synagogue is a loner word from Greek. What is the big loner word from Hebrew to Greek? Remember? Remember the words for truth? Amen. Amen is the big loner word from Hebrew to Greek. There's also a few others, but you know we find those in the New Testament documents. Very interesting. So amen means, uh, I think I had it someplace, but amen means literally I agree with you. It's a support, but it also means truth. In, uh, in both in Greek and Hebrew, but it's an uh, interesting word. So, you know, and the Greeks don't have a word for truth. Their word means not false, uh, lithia. So, in any case, ahab is the word that was used in the 116th Psalm, which is translated in that psalm as love, love for God. But the problem with that is ahab can't be a love for God. Why? 
Well, look at the definition. To have affection for sexually or otherwise. It's literally, in a, in a sense, it's physical love. And if you remember, the writer of the 116th Psalm used the word fondle in the sense of physically touching, that God touched him physically. So, you know, this is a very personal, very human word. It's very similar to, for example, in the Greek, phileo. Phileo love. The love between brothers. And I told you, remember, um, in the, there's almost, I don't think there's any case, there may be a case in the, New Te in the Old Testament where a man says that he ahabs a woman. I don't think there is. Because in the Hebrew mindset of their culture, men don't love women. And likewise, in the Greek mindset, men would never phileo a woman. That just couldn't be, right? Sheshed translated karis, or grace. Sheshed is literally bowing the neck to an inferior. Literally. But this word is the word that means is usually translated kindness. Sometimes it's translated loving kindness. Sometimes it's translated love. And let's see, that, what was it translated in the, yeah, <laughs> favor uh, in the King James. Favor, good deed, leanness, uh, kindliness, loving kindness, merciful kindness, mercy, pity, reproach, and wicked thing. Uh-oh. How can we get wicked thing or reproach or pity out of this? Remember I told you that in especially cultures like, you, very highly euphemistic cultures like Hebrew, it's very contextually based. So the word can be used, um, I don't think it's right to call it a paradox or a, a sarcasm. But in euphemistic cultures, you know, the words are very contextually based. So it is, you know, it is potential that you could say that you love your wife and use ahab, although like I said, I'm not sure it's ever used in that context. Men knew their wives, they didn't love their wives. But a hob used within the context of a wife could mean love. You know, like it says, sexually or otherwise. Shashed is never used, is not used of men by men of other men in general. It's used in terms of God. And usually shashed is what God shows to man. In other words, bowing his neck to the inferior. That's what it means. So we see this word used all the time. Now I told you I'd find the other two love words for you. And I did. It's dod and again. Dod is the word that means literally, it means the love of an uncle for a niece. And it means basically incestuous love. Love in an incestuous context. Um, it's used in Ezekiel. It's used in a couple other places, but Ezekiel, I pulled this one out. It's the first one I pulled. Uh, I made you grow like the plant of the field. You grew up and developed. This is Ezekiel 16, 7 through 9. I made you grow like the plant of the field. You grew up and developed and became the most beautiful of jewels. Your breasts were formed and your hair grew. You who were naked and bare. Later I passed by, and when I looked at you and saw that you were old enough for love, doubt, for sexual love and uncle, of an uncle, I spread the cover of my garment over you, which means she, he had sex with her, and covered her nakedness. I gave you my solemn oath and entered into a covenant with you, declares the sovereign Yahweh, and you became mine. And in 9 it says, I bathed with water and washed the blood from you and put ointments on you. The very, very strong sexual connotation with Daud, and uh, we'd have to study Ezekiel to understand exactly what the author was getting into at that point, but this is that loner word from Persia that Ezekiel uses in a very sexually charged context. Egeb is equally a very sexual uh, word. It means literally the, to breathe after, to have passion after. It's like pathos in Greek. It means to love sensually and usually applied to prostitutes. But because like I said, do you love your wife in Hebrew culture? God forbid, you know, you, you have, it's like a Victorian thing, right? Never, had, you know, ah, ah, right? So, Egev, usually we use it in the context of a prostitute. And, it, and from Ezekiel 33, 1, 31 through 33, my people come, out, come to you as they use you and sit before you and listen to your words, but they do not put them into practice. With their mouths express devotion, but their hearts are greedy for unjust gain. 
Uh, 32, indeed, to them you are nothing more than one who sings egeth, sensual love songs, with a beautiful voice and plays an instrument well. For they hear your words, but do not put them into practice. When all this comes true, and it surely will, they will know that a prophet has been among them. So, we see the four words that are used, that can be potentially translated as love, in Hebrew. Sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. Generally, this is the one that's used as love for God to man. This is the word used of man to man. And in the Hebrew context, man does not love God. Not in the sense that we sense it with, uh, you know, in our sense. But we saw in the 116th Psalm that the writer used a very personal context. So that's important. Now, I want to move over to the 117th Psalm. And we can do that. And also start on the 118th Psalm. As I said, we're studying the Hillel. And the Hillel includes the 113th to the 118th. This is the, th this is the Psalms that are done during the, um, during the festivals. And I gave you all that information. We're also looking in the Psalms for indications of when they were written. When they were written, who wrote them, et cetera, et cetera, we found some good evidence, historical evidence. That's the neat thing is within the Psalms, you can find this historical evidence to tell you when these Psalms were written and possibly by whom they were written. Um, let's look at 117 Psalms. 117 Psalms starts out, Hallel, the Yo Jehovah, the, the Yahweh, the preexistent God, Kol, Goy, all foreign nations. Kol, Goy. Now, what's important is, what's the implication if I translate the word goy as nations? Who's that include? Or, Gentiles. Well, goy includes only who? Gentiles. Only Gentiles, right? But if I just translate this as nations, what does that imply? I'm talking about Israel, too, but it's not. Because it starts out, it says, Hallel, Yahweh, the preexistent God, Kol, Kol is the word for all, all a whole, the whole, you goy, literally, you Gentile, foreign nations, extol, shabach. Uh, and shabach means, extol is probably a good word, because shabach means to address in a loud tone. Isn't this interesting? Because what does Hallel generally mean? What, can anybody... Tell me what Hallel, we've talked about this. You said clear sound. Clear? Clear, clear color or sound. Okay. Clear color or sound. And mostly meaning color. But yeah, clear sound is a really good definition of Hallel. Clear, make a clear sound or a clear sound. Well, we have Shabak. Shabak means to address in a loud tone. Well, if I were going to pick, what, what, would I, what do you think I would pick? Shabak, right? Shabbat. It sounds loud too. Hallel, Shabbat. But instead, these all begin with Hallel, a clear tone or a clear color. Wow, very interesting about that. But it says Shabbat, address in a loud tone. So what does this imply? If I already just said Hallel Yahweh, Hallel Yahweh. And then I have to tell you to address him in a loud tone. What does that imply about a Hallel? It's not loud. It doesn't have to be loud. What does it have to be? Clear. Clear, but not loud. Now here's something I want you to put in your little thinking caps, or big thinking caps. All right? Remember, the 118th Psalm is supposed to be said by the high priest one time a year, and that's a time when he clearly says the name of God. So what is the problem with that? What did he do with the name of God? Because he did the 117th Psalm, and it says, Hallel Yahweh. So what did he say when he said, Hallel Yahweh? Ada. Ada. Right? Because he couldn't say the name of God except one time, right? So what did he not do? He didn't say it clearly. It's just very, it's an interesting cultural aspect to this. Can you see Jesus? Can you see Jesus at the festival booth 
at Rosh, uh, Rosh Kodesh. And he's there, and they're getting ready to do the 118th Psalm. And every time the high priest and the chorus and everybody says, Hallel, Bar. What do you think he's doing? Ah! He said, ah, what's wrong with these people? It says clear. Right? It doesn't say mumble. Hallel means clear. So I just point that out as a cultural thing that's, that's very interesting. So that means that when you say your hallelujah, you enunciate it. Because otherwise you're not doing a hallelujah, right? And when you say Hallel Yahweh, it's a big deal. It says, it says, praise Hallel Jehovah, the preexistent God, the whole of the Goy, the foreign nations, and then there someone has put, you know, okay, there's punctuation at there's punctuation in the Psalms, right? No, it's all added. But you guys in the NIV, and I have it right here, I have the semicolon. So it may be a semicolon, it may not be a semicolon. Because it says Shabbat. Who's supposed to Shabbat? Extol with a loud tone. The Goy nations. And then it says, Shabbat, Kol you Uma, the community of the people from the same mother. Now, who do you think that means? The Jewish people, because why? How do you know this is Jewish people? Because they trace their ancestry through their mothers. They trace their ancestry through the mother. So who is this first verse telling to extol the Lord? All the Gentiles, all the nations of the Gentiles, and Israel, the Jews. Everybody. Everybody. The 117th Psalm applies to everybody. And then it goes in the two. For Gabar, and if you remember the word Gabar, Gabar is the same word that was used describing um, who was a hero, who was a guy hero of Ruth was Boaz. Boaz, Boaz was Gabar Shayib. Gabar was was powerful and strong, a mighty warrior. Gabar Shayib. And so it says, for Gabar, which is the same word used for Boaz, is his Sheshet, his Sheshet. This is God, Sheshet, toward us, and it's Hemet. Literally, Hemet is a variation in Hebrew of the word Amen, Amen, and Amen means truth or agreement of Yahweh. And then we get this thing that we're going to see in the 136th Psalm. We've seen it in other Psalms. It says, and by the way, every time you see endures, that's added. It literally says, Olam Halel. Olam Halel Yahweh. Olam Halel Yahweh. Olam means, in Hebrew, I have a choice of two words for time. There are only two words for time in Hebrew. <coughs> Yom and Olem. 